नया कानून बना नया कानून बनाओ गाना है फिल्मी गाना है मुकेश का एक गाना है आई फोगेट दी वर्ड ऑफ द ओरिजिनल सॉन्ग ना हम तो अपनी पैरेडी ही याद है वो एक गाता है जब नौकरी मिलेगी तो फिर क्या होगा एंड कोरस से क्या होगा बदन पे सूट होगा आह पैर में बूट होगा बाहों में गोरी का बदन होगा जहाँ पे गाना था यहाँ पे टूटता है Naturally, 
टू नरेटिव सिंगिंग जिसका अंग्रेज में आप एक किसी कहानी सुना रहे हैं वेरी वेरी पॉपुलर फॉर्म कुछ हमारे प्लेयर हैं जिसके अंदर गाना जो है वो क्योंकि अब तक जो हुआ है उसको समझ कर और ऑडियंस को आगे लेके जाता है हमारे ग्रुप के मेमोरियल लेक्चर ना पता नहीं वो भी मुश्किल से पढ़
जिसको कि हम पूरी समझदारी कहते हैं सोच जो है उस नाटक के अंदर वो पूरे प्ले के स्ट्रक्चर के अंदर इनहेरिट होती है ऐसा नहीं है कि आपने पूरा नाटक दिखाया कि भाई ये तो आप हमको आप हमने आपको एंटरटेन कर दिया हमने कुछ मटक लिए कुछ नाच लिए और अब आप सुनिए हमारा अगले अगले असली मकसद और एक नारे की शक्ल में या गाने की शक्ल में या भाषा की शक्ल में ले लिया ऐसा नहीं होता लाइन जो है वो पूरी जो अंडरस्टैंडिंग है वो उस नाटक के स्क्रिप्ट में इन रिलेशन टू द सब्जेक्ट वो रिफ्लेक्ट होती है एक सब्जेक्ट के ऊपर तरह तरह की स्क्रिप्ट रखी जा सकती है एक ही सवाल के ऊपर मसलन बेरोजगारी का सवाल है उसके ऊपर मैं समझता हूँ बहुत तरह की स्क्रिप्ट लिखी जा सकती है हर हर किस्म के एक्सपीरियंस से एक नई स्क्रिप्ट निकल के आएगी और हर शख्स जो उस सब्जेक्ट पे लिखने की कोशिश करेगा कुछ आज एक नए तरह की एक स्क्रिप्ट लिखेगा मेरा पूरा नेटवर्क तुम्हारी है आपका जिंदा है मैं तुम्हारे पैर पर अरे भैया अरे मुंह से निकली बात सच्चा है तेरे से रहा कह दिया तेरे ये काम नहीं है तो नहीं है नहीं जा अपनी न सदियों पुरानी पीढ़ियों को तोड़ दे आ चुका है वक्त अभी तालियां मुस्कुराए था राज जाहिर हो चुका है असली जिम्मेदार का 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 हर बार तुम की टक्कर में संघर्ष हमारा नारा है हर बार तुम की टक्कर में संघर्ष हमारा नारा है Hello everyone and welcome to the 27th Saptar Hashmi Memorial Lecture. We at Jannatya Manch are thrilled to have Professor Milena Dragicevic Sesic as the speaker and Professor Sumangla Damudaran as chair this year. Milena will be speaking on theatre and the struggle for social justice, ethics and aesthetics of care and solidarity. The chair for tonight's lecture is Sumangla Damudaran. She is an economist and a musician and a wonderful singer. Uh, she is involved in teaching and research in economics, development studies, and popular music studies at Ambedkar University, Delhi. She has undertaken research and documentation of the musical tradition of the Indian People's Theatre Association from the 1940s and 1950s, and has performed extensively from the documented repertoire. She she has also collaborated with poets and musicians from South Africa in a project titled Insurrections, and is currently engaged in. researching the relationship between music and migration particularly of women in slavery and servitude sumangla is a very very dear friend of janam and has performed with us on a number of occasions and we're very glad that she is the chair this year professor milena dragicevic sesic is a professor of cultural policy and cultural management and former president of university of arts belgrade where she now holds the unesco chair in cultural policy and management Her research interest covers a wide scope of topics in culture and heritage management, leadership and entrepreneurship, culture policies, urban policies, culture and media studies. She has authored around 15 books and more than 150 essays which have been translated into 17 languages. Uh she works as an expert in cultural policy and management for the European Union, European Cultural Foundation, the Council of Europe, UNESCO. and she has uh, guest lectured in numerous universities all across the world um she actually she has also mentored uh, and she was she played a really key role in the creation of smart which is also india's first theater management training program and a lot of us uh, at janam have known milena since 2010 when she came to india and uh, met us and some other theater groups to understand our work since then we've been in touch and uh, i uh, i think i can say it for everyone at janam who's known her that she's part of a larger janam family and uh, uh, we're we're really really glad that she's agreed to deliver the lecture uh, uh, thank you so much and now i would just like to request sumangla to take over the proceedings thank you Uh, 
thank you so much uh, sanya uh, and uh, it uh, gives me great pleasure uh, it's a great privilege in fact uh, for me to be chairing uh, the sabdar hashmi memorial lecture this year and um, uh, my association with jannatyam manch uh, goes back to around 37 years in fact to be precise and incidentally sabdar was the first person that i met in jannatyam manch and uh, it was a uh, short association of just a few years but uh, something that played a very very major role in my own uh, life uh, so and it gives me great uh, pleasure to uh, chair this uh, lecture which is being uh, delivered this year by milena dragisevich sesic and uh, it's a pleasure to meet milena um, in the context of this lecture and also to hear her speak about something that in some way as cultural activists all of us have um uh, you know not uh, someone like me has not directly engaged with cultural policy uh, but uh, uh, has obviously has had um you know ha i've thought a lot about uh, what cultural policy would be particularly in the kind of uh, context that we come from today uh, what it would need to be what are the safeguards that one would need in terms of a cultural policy uh in uh, so that we don't reach where we have in a country like ours particularly so uh, with milena's uh, vast experience uh, given all the extensive writing that she has done and also the very um, important positions that she has held both as an academic as well as an administrator uh, in different countries uh, i think this is a very very um, apt choice at, for this particular lecture um you know timed as it is in the particular juncture that india is in today so i'll hand over now to milena uh, to deliver the sabdar hashmi memorial lecture for 2020 over to you milena thank you very much sumangala and i will now start sharing my screen and um I feel of course extremely honored to be invited for a Sadr Hashmi memorial lecture and uh, as it was previously said it's uh, already 10 years of collaboration with the Janam but also with India Theater Forum and uh, it was an experience that changed my life and that showed that to what extent cultural activism theatrical activism has a sense in a fighting for a better world even more today than ever before so for a topic we really uh, together have chosen theater and the struggle for social justice trying to value those words care solidarity empathy uh, hospitality in contemporary theater life and it coincided in some way with the sudanva book halabol which gave me really a uh, fantastic opportunity to get to know better the extent of uh, activism and contribution of sardar hashmi to Uh, not only theatrical life but political life of a country and i thought that at the same time that this lecture anyway it's part of sadr hashmi memorial lecture so it's devoted to him that we have to be aware how many artists still today are dying in different prisons in turkey in egypt throughout the world they are censored they are suffering only because they dared to raise their voice in favor of the oppressed so in a certain way i would like also to devote to all of them and to the father of the theater of the oppressed of augusto boal that i was uh having a privilege to meet him in paris while i was studying there to make his interview with him and to translate the book the theater of the press that was one of the first books that i ever translated to serbo croat uh, serbo croat language and he was the one that uh, in fact uh, uh, have uh, 
introduced me to the culture and aesthetics of solidarity, of care, of empathy with, with all subaltern, exiled, oppressed people, all those that are even prevented to mourn. In the time when we met, I didn't have much experience with it. Uh, now this, uh, uh, but later on, it was shown uh, in the war of Yugoslavia to what extent the role of artists as the voice of counter public, as the voice against can be or could be very important. I was born in Yugoslavia and I truly believed during my life in Yugoslavia that we are living in a country of social justice, in a country which officially didn't have any social classes, any social distinction, where everyone is going to school. It was much later that I realized that certain groups like Roma children, not that they didn't have rights, but no one really cared that really this social justice relates to everybody. Yes, I can say academics and simple workers lived in same buildings. We all are getting our apartments through this state social care and so on. Now we are transitioning in capitalism and in the building where I'm living, all working class sold their apartments because it's area of the city, it's more expensive and they are now going to suburb to enable their children to have separate apartments and so on. So we are not living anymore in Belgrade in a city of equity, of social justice. But even as I said, in time of Yugoslavia, the truth was not so simple. So the aim of this let's say lecture or discussion, which I would like to be, to become discussion, is to explore how theater world can contribute or is contributing to larger social issues and first of all, to social justice. Then to see who are those cultural and theater activists of today and are there any dilemmas or how those dilemmas and values concerning solidarity, care, hospitality are perceived during COVID-19 crisis. And yes, I have to say that when we met, my first experience of India theater life happened to be 1st of January on this rally where different theater groups and uh, college uh, theaters and so on, made their performances throughout the day of 1st January 2010 in honor of Sardar Hashmi. And the next day we were sitting outside in a very cold Delhi day to make discussion and interview and to discuss about possibility of development of Jana. And that's the reason I put this photo then a few years later, I could visit Janam in their new premises so that this theater and many other theaters and many other artistic collectives that they are hosting in this building in Sardar studio uh, do not have to be frozen or to freeze outside because now they have their home. For some reasons, it's uh, so. I would like to start uh, with the present situation. Where is contemporary world now? And for that reason, I would just quote briefly the book of Dominique Moissy, French uh, political scientist, that is speaking about geopolitics of emotion. But books was written ten years ago, so India has a part which probably today uh, in this geopolitics of emotion wouldn't be shared because he was speaking about cultural fear that the whole Western hemisphere 
is in cultural fear, fear of Islam, fear of the other, fear of everything, which we see excellently well in Brexit politics, in Trump politics, in everything that is happening in, uh, first of all, in Europe, but in the United States also. Or culture of humiliation, which according to his words, was reserved for Africa and Arab countries. But my country, Serbia, and many other Balkan countries are still feeling this uh, culture of humiliation, rejection from the world, and many of things that are happening are in fact provoked with this humiliation. Of course, not to speak about Palestine, the country humiliated since uh, 1948 and long before, but that was like ultimate humiliation. And uh, why I'm telling this is because I think that the work of Janam regarding Palestinian theater is really something worthwhile uh, speaking about. For India and Asian countries, Dominic Moisi said that they are living in a culture of hope. That they are living now something that Europe and the Western world used to live immediately after World War II. But this culture of hope, I think can be seen only in the propaganda and promotional material of Prime Minister of India, as well as our president of Serbia. Serbia is living never better. But in reality, we know that we are living also in a culture of both humiliation and fear. Somehow hope is far away. All these processes that we are witnessing now, I'm not going to debate widely. Globalization, migrations, because you know all of that. Now we have, even in Serbia, never uh, before we had that many, let's call them, uh, I don't like the word migrants because migrant doesn't mean anything, but exilants, asylum seekers, uh, that are re refugees from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. People would say like, oh, this is economic migrants. No, many of those people are really living in the such uh, subaltern, humiliated position that they had to leave their countries. Not to speak about other confessional divisions that are uh, making all uh, a lot of troubles throughout from New Zealand to United States, racial divisions, journalism, which lost all of its credibility, and especially something that I would like to underline, political systems are never been that populist, authoritarian, dictatorial, but at the same time called democratic. As for example, my country is named officially democratic. India is also called democratic, but in all of those, England and so on, but uh, the populist communication and so on are dominating. In uh, those new populist policies based on uh, emotional rhetorics are unfortunately influencing cultural policies and consequently they're influencing policies of theaters, especially theaters that are state theaters or city theaters, theaters supported by public money. And such theaters, there are quite a lot, especially in the Western world, not everywhere, but even in Asia, for example, in Vietnam, in many countries where the state is uh, official supporter, but also controller of cultural processes. This uh, populist rhetorics in cultural field is mixed also with neoliberal rhetorics, which is speaking about audiences as customers, as consumers, and public good, for example, or art 
and cultural work as something which is done in public interest is not really important that much. Uh, they might speak, populist politics pre prefer to speak about culture in national interest and nationalism somehow, although it was not in theory supposed to go that nicely, easily with neoliberal system, it's going nicely with this neoliberal system. So what then is a culture in a populist democracies? I took this liberty to show you just small example. What is, uh, for what public budget is easily spent? For example, in my city of Belgrade, New Year Eve celebration, cost much more than any culture or theater. I'm not going to bother you with, uh, uh, how I'd say, uh, numbers and so on, because that's not going to be remembered. But this image, commercial kitschy image of New Year Eve, that has nothing to do even with the national tradition because celebration of New Year Eve was basically never a national tradition. And it was even by nationalists for a long time, they were accusing communists to bring celebration of New Year Eve to um, suppress celebration of Christmas. But in fact, here, what you can see is not even celebration of New Year Eve, it's celebration of consumerism, because even packages, as you can see on the left side, are the most important part of this nice, so-called nice decorations. We stayed in my city for six months. And that's something which for most of us uh, cultural people is unacceptable. So who is speaking today about social justice? What are political parties or social forces that are speaking about it. Public policies of welfare states are not speaking anymore about social justice. Socialist communist policies are totally suppressed. You can hear today how um, Trump is accusing Biden for being anarchist, even communist and so on. So it became a very bad word and new parties that are created by young people are carefully avoiding these words because those wording sound for them retro, old fashioned, so new left. Uh, has now to find new discourse to be able to go through. But who is dealing really today with issues of contemporary slavery, about poverty, about caste system, for example, in India, a few years ago, Indian ambassador on official uh, lecture at the Faculty of Political Science said that issue of caste in India has been solved 50 years ago, immediately after liberation. And for her, this was questioned by student, for her, this question was closed. And I remember very emotional and very touchy debate with Samudaya Theatre in Bangalore, where young people that are actors in this theatre spoke openly with me how they feel burden of their caste on their shoulders and how this is still very present, very present issue not to speak about religious segregation, not only in India, everywhere in the world. And unfortunately, till two days ago in uh, Montenegro, again started these uh, hatred words of Christians against the Muslims and so on. So you never know where and when and in which moment things are going to uh, burst. Women subordination and segregation, even in very developed country, where, what is the country with the biggest distinction uh, about property of men and women? One of the richest country in the world, Japan, 
this is the country of the poorest woman and the richest, uh, richest man, and so on. So who is dealing with all those issues? I can say that only art and artists are seriously dealing with those issues. It's not really... Is it yes? Is there something I should know? I've heard some voice, but now... Milena, Milena, go ahead. Okay, okay, sorry. It, I thought that someone is addressing me that probably it stopped. Uh, so, children labor, it's still an issue. So my question would be, could we, could we be living in a post-purpose world? We have to have purpose. And it seems that there are still a lot of artistic collective, artists, organizations, and institutions that they are not experiencing purpose fatigue uh, or that they are practicing in uh, concordance with these new technologies and the new social networks, this click and forget practice. I'm clicking for the petition on Avaz or whatever to support some issue and then I forget. I did my citizen duty, I clicked. So who is not clicking? Who is doing something more than, than clicking? I think it's really uh, artistic collectives. But I want you to start uh, now to focus on theaters. What are what theater in 20th century did? What were main roots of development? So I used one table, but I edited it from my colleague and compatriot and good friend, uh, unfortunately uh, died prematurely, Dragon Clyde. And he made one very simplistic uh, categorization of theater world on a public theater, repertory theaters, commercial theaters, experimental theaters, but I added also art collectives and amateur theater. However, I think there is a big and important uh, group of activist theaters that are not experimental in a sense what experiment as artistic experiment meant, but that they are experimental in a way how they approach theatrical work and artistic, uh, artistic research. And from my understanding, a lot of theater groups and collectives within India Theater Forum belong to this category, which is somehow going beyond all of these. What for me in my cultural policy and management research, because for us in Europe, these two are intertwined because most of the culture still is produced with the public support and under public control. I wanted to see what happened with social responsibility in uh, repertory theaters, in city theaters, in national theaters. And we saw that, yes, they are executing their art in so-called free countries, but the level of auto-censorship, what they're putting on the repertory is going beyond they are going to admit to themselves. How they create repertory, more toward the supposed interest of the loyal audience so that they can have biggest uh, uh, amount of the box offices and not really according to the issues that are uh, tearing the world, that are destroying countries, that start destroying our values and so on. So theater of solidarity, theater of empathy, you can see more outside of repertory theater, definitely outside of commercial theater, they never thought even a minute about it. Somewhere in between experimental 
theater groups and amateur theater in those crossings of what we in the Balkans are calling culture of counter public, culture of civil society, because this uh, term that was brought in feminism by Nancy Fraser and others of counter public still today can be very valuable. And I think that even among those of you who came to my talk today, most, even us who are part of academia, in many different ways, we belong to counter publics. We don't belong to the mainstream officially publicly supported values and cultures. We try to use our positions and possibilities to question and to really, uh, how to say, a little bit um, make turmoil in, in uh, habitual conventions of contemporary world. Of course, from time to time, we can see performances done by city theaters like, like that one. This is the performance based on documentary material or about Slovenian fascists who became the right hand of the Hitler during World War II, in spite of the fact that Hitler himself and the fascist government of Germany despised, truly despised Slovenes, not only Slovenians, but all Slavic people, Slavs, among them Slovenians also. And that they made in Slovenia, for example, in the eastern part of Slovenia, northeast part, ethnic cleansing in 1941 and expelled from that part of Slovenia, uh, Slovenian Slavic population towards Serbia. They, of course, returned after the war because Hitler luckily lost the war. But this story, how fascism can easily get in society, can be spread even among humiliated other, uh, became again very actual. Uh, we see now that in spite of everything, a lot of Latino population voted for Trump is in spite of the fact that he got the elections by proposing the wall against Latin America and so on. So this is one of the examples of social responsibility of public theaters to raise those uh, questions that are today extremely important. There are other examples. This one I took because I'm somehow very perplexed with it. Jan Faber, very celebrity work, theater work, Mount Olympus, the cult of the tragedy, 24 hours theater performance. Of course, I couldn't resist because that was one of these, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 performances that happened in the world happened in Belgrade. So I couldn't resist to go. And that was aesthetically fabulous. That was provoking, that was challenging, but still when I summarized it, luckily it was transmitted by public television. That was the only moment for 24 hours. Uh, direct transmission of one theater performance. At that moment, I was proud that I'm still living in the country that has public television, that can commit 24 hours of its time in continue for the direct transmission of theater performance. But at the same time, I thought, they did it because that's a spectacle. Because we live in a society of spectacle. Because it was glamorous. In most glamorous uh, performative auditorium, theatrical space of Congress Center, Sava, did in socialist Yugoslavia once upon a time. So to what extent all of that is honest? All of that is part, is that really aimed to people? 
or it's also aiming somehow us, cultural elites, to reinforce our uh, mistaken belief that we are still some social elites. Cultural elites for long are not anymore social elites. Today we can speak only about financial elites, celebrity elites, or political elites. Elites of knowledge, science, culture, art, they are not, they do not, uh, they cannot be called as elites anymore because they don't have any real social work. So I would like to share this piece of art. This is the artwork of Vahida Ramujkic, the Bosnian artist living in Serbia, where she have uh, she made this piece for one of my books in French. That's the reason that uh, the words are in French, but you can understand. On the left, it's, uh, I don't know, probably it's, uh, let's see, yeah. Uh, it's uh, cultural policies. On the other side is educational policies. And they try those policies, they try to build, to knit the pullover of democracy, of social justice, of equality, human dignity, and so on. But the, the market pressures of the neoliberal uh, society are pulling whatever these two policies try to make together apart and the uh, profit becomes the only criteria and so on. So during this COVID crisis, I try to see what is happening to arts and culture. And with my colleague, which also has a name Milena, but Milena Stefanovic, we made a research. What is happening in our small country in the arts and culture world? And to what extent the importance of arts have risen? And that's true. We could see that all politicians, everyone inviting us citizens to stay at home was saying, and you can watch theater performances on YouTube, on specific YouTube channels of every city theater, of every national theater and so on. And they promised and that's what they did. They, they gave salaries for all artists employed in a public system. But others, freelance artists, those street theaters, those that are doing installations in situ, uh, working in, uh, with, um, I would say, vulnerable groups and so on, they were left aside as their work is not important as they do not exist in a system. That was the moment when solidarity after so many years had been raised within theater people. Association of Drama Artists stood up and said, we who are employed by uh, city and state theaters, we are ashamed to receive our salary for non-working and our friends and colleagues who also had contracts with us, but haven't been employed and working aside in their theater troops and groups are with a zero possibility to earn for their living. And after four months of pressure, let's say not for, from March to June, yeah, that's four months, after these four months of different lobbying, advocacy, that's what we call bottom-up cultural policy. Freelance artists, those that are registered, that means not street artists, not those that are truly subaltern, that are truly from the margins of society, but those that are members of art association get their, uh, their um, uh, some minimal wages basically to uh, survive. So 
Populist policies, they don't care of arts. They care of representation. The last call, for example, for film support was showing that explicitly, but implicitly it is known in theater. You might have small amount of money for your art film project, but you might have much more if you have a film with a national thematic. For Serbia, it means medievalization because Serbia was the most, how I'd say, it was the kingdom during from 12th to 14th century. So that was like a important part of our history. And paradoxically, our government is giving money to commercial films. And that you might say like, what's that about? Because they would like to endorse that all cinematography becomes commercial, that every artist would in future earn its money on the market. And that's something which is happening throughout the former welfare states, which would like to cut their finances to arts and culture. But today they are financing creative industries, much more film, music, so commercial forms of art, then they would like to finance some poetry writing. No one wants to finance a book of poetry, for example, because who cares? It's not that red. The number of copies is not big. It's not important for elections and so on. So another question that I would like to raise maybe later for discussion, where is the possibility for critical reflection about contextual artistic practice? We, and I can see that only in independent civil society art organizations that are more and more connecting with uh, groups of intellectuals, with cultural journals uh, to raise certain uh, issues uh, debate. Old patterns of cultural governance are not really replaced with a different, new, more modern, just uh, they're underlying that economy, raising of economy. We could see that also in these public health policies that they are always uh, in fight with economy. Like what we would like to have, uh, death of economy or death of people. Who cares about people? It's more important for economy to survive. But in the, at the same time, many of the artists, especially during this COVID crisis, started questioning even art powers. Who is, what is makes art powerful and what makes power powerful? Uh, I also wanted to show few works of performative artists from Serbia and how they relate to books to theories and so on. It's one performance, video performance of uh, Serbian artist Milica Tomic. But in this performance, she's saying, I'm Bosnian, I'm Norwegian, I'm Chinese, I'm Albanian and so on. And her body becomes more and more bloody as all this ethnic identity and nativism are provoking more and more hatred. And when we debate, and when art scene debate this kind of work, there are two key books to link about. And one is Amin Malouf book, Killing Identities. And the other is the book of Arjun Apadurai, Fear of Small Numbers, where he tried to explain why big nations like Hindi, are fearing small number of Muslims in India. Why Balkan biggest nation, which is Serbian, is fearing of Albanians, of Croatians, which are smaller nations comparatively, and so on. Uh, the work of Maya Bayevich, one of the many performative works, 
is about new imposition to art of today that art has to be national, that an artist has to be national. We have to present ourselves in order to exist as Croatian artist, French artist, uh, Norwegian artist, and so on. And Maya Bajevic denied this uh, ethnic identification of her arts as much as Marina Abramovic, ironically, in 75, did this uh, statement about art must be beautiful and artists must be beautiful, uh, of course, thinking exactly opposite. So contemporary artists are very much debating a group of artists within the counter publics, the concept of commons. And you, I'm seeing that the time is running, so I'm going to skip this, but I'm going to say, yes, we would like, and they would like to fight for the commons, for cultural rights. And those cultural rights should be a central part of the theater policy practice. If the theater wants to be in a public realm, it has to refer to cultural rights of everyone. But who are those everyone? Are those only citizens of this country or every human being? Asylum seeker, when he comes, he has his cultural rights that are denied completely that no one is caring because humanitarian organizations are just thinking about minimal health and uh, how to say security issues for surviving. So uh, the theaters that are today the best are those groups of artists and artistic collectives that create so-called participatory projects and based on civic imagination. What is civic in imagination? It's really what a common citizen, a person in a certain community wants to bring and wants to lobby for and wants to, uh, to create together with a theater troupe that is active in its, how would say, neighborhood, in its community, and so on. Artists very often foresee things much before the things starts to happen. Here, for example, we see one piece of art, which is from the beginning of 90s, from the Russian group AES. It's part of the Islamic project developed throughout the world with the Moroccan camels and tapis on the Babur in center of Paris, with this covered uh, freedom, uh, liberty statue in New York, uh, Belgrade totally, for example, reconstructed as Islamic city and so on. Why they did that at the beginning of 90s? They felt and they experienced how this fear of Islam is entering the space of their own country, Russia, because the way how they treated migrant workers from former Soviet republics of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and so on. Every year, for example, 2,000 dead Tajik workers would be bodies, would be, how to say, exported back to Tajikistan and the Tajik government didn't dare to say anything because the Tajik government, the Tajik state is living out of the money that the Tajik workers that are working in Russia are sending home. So in international relations, in our lives, there are so many uh, lies. So theater world have to try to make, to open questions and to foster civic imagination as a public good. Pier Luigi Sacco, one uh, theoretician from Italy, uh, said that we, are, we should live now in the cultural realm 3.0, where citizen is in the same, at the same time, creator. So this 
knowledge, artistic explorations should be linked with civic imagination. And that becomes an activist theater struggle for social justice. Because each of us, every citizen, has a right to recreate its community, its city, to contribute actively. Thus, I put here, but we don't have time to speak about it, many of those participative projects that are now raised uh, one that I participated was like uh, my memory on Yugoslavia that each of us had showed objects for our apartments that belongs to this period of uh, uh, one country of let's say uh, at least 90% social justice, never 100% as we believed, but much more than today. So we come to the, uh, to the final part of the presentation to speak really about theater with a purpose. Janam, you know, but I would like to say a few words about failures also. One attempt of Birmingham Repertory Theater to put on stage Bexley performance, but also some examples of streetwise theaters, but also many examples from my own country, how theater, for example, might be the only actor in the policies of remembrance. Uh, when it, uh, um, when it refers to the genocide against Bosnian Muslim population in Srebrenica, it's literally only Dach theater that every 10th of July is making public performance together with Women in Black civil society movement on public square of Belgrade to remind people on Srebrenica genocide. Uh, all other public stakeholders, political parties, cultural public institutions, they keep silent. They do not dare. But you see one thing also from this photo. There are not many people around. People approach, they see public theater. The very moment they read the transparent, and when they can read that oblivion and silence about the crime is also the crime. And the moment they read the word Srebrenica, they run away. They don't want, they're ashamed. They don't want to be reminded. But there are also this Dach Theater of Belgrade. They're specialized for this kind of provocative theater plays. Here you see one, in the um, in the theater in the bus of uh, regular bus of Belgrade and so on, the other theater that is very famous for its uh, political street engaged performances is Center for Cultural Decontamination. And here we can see the performance of Macbeth was done in front of the cordon of police in support to student protest. And still today, for every festival, for example, that this Center for Cultural Decontamination is organizing about Mirdita Dobardan, it's a festival of Albanian Serbian uh, artistic collaboration. Uh, the cordons of police are there, but now to protect them from right wing militants, groups, and so on. There are different examples of their performances in the bus, in the public parks, in shopping malls, and so on. They are very often anti war performances, and so on. But uh, uh, or like this on the right side, which is a video work, which is also the only work done in the moment when Serbian police was doing, uh, uh, let's say, attacks on Albanian civilians on Kosovo. And that was uh, one of the rare artists that dared to make a performance and to film this performance later. But in the so-called democracies, like uh, United Kingdom, many attempts to make something that will be defending cultural rights 
for the new population, such as um, uh, Sikh community in Birmingham failed. What happened? The theaters realized that although they are city repertory theater, that although they are on public money, basically they have uh, their repertory is British or let's say Western white white. And that city of Birmingham have more than 50% non-white people. So they made a call for a theater text, for a drama text that would relate to different communities of Birmingham. And the prize was won by Gurpreet Kaurbati, which is a part of the Sikh community. Unfortunately, the, on the day when this uh, performance was supposed to be done, Sikh community gather around and you can see the police uh, defending the, the theater. So the Birmingham Repertory Theater said, we are not censoring the work, but we are abandoning performance on health and safety grounds. That was more than 10 years ago. No one else, no other theater in Europe decided to put this drama on stage. Everyone is, uh, why? Because they are all afraid to contest religious leaders of any community. And we see that today, for example, a Roman Catholic Archbishop was really supporting this decision that, uh, and the demand of the Sikh uh, religious leader that this should be abolished. So uh, we see that dialogue was not really uh, existing. Uh, everyone, they said on the left, you can see the theater, we hope that the work should be seen and discussed. The Sikh community said it's the theater made right decision and uh, common sense prevailed and it never have to be redone again. And it was never uh, redone again. Uh, in spite of all efforts of Neil Foster of other organization and so on. So maybe uh, it can be nice even to end with these um, uh, words of Gurpreet Kaurbat, although I'm not reaching the end of my uh, PowerPoint, that she believes that drama should be provocative because as provocative, it's relevant. I wrote back to because I passionately oppose injustice and hypocrisy. And because writing drama allows me to create characters, stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, why I wanted to tell this is to show that street censorship is active everywhere in the world. And that auto-censorship is also active because no one ever dared to put this uh, performance uh, on the stage. There are many other examples. Here is the French one. I'm going to skip some of that. There are also risky examples of performances, but those risky examples can happen in so-called cultural capitals of the world, which is in this moment, city of Berlin. So the history of violence, performance based on the French Louis text uh, in the direction of Ostermeyer, or alternative für Deutschland, the performance that really is questioning the rays of nationalism, populism, uh, uh, isolationism, sovereignism, whatever you can say in uh, Germany of today could be done again only in a very special theater as Gorky Theater in Berlin is by Croatian theater director, Oliver Frelich, who became persona non grata throughout the world because his performances are banned in Poland, in Latvia, 
in uh, Sarajevo. In Serbia, 16 actors of a city theater refused to work with him because in advance they knew that he is, um, uh, that he might endanger their feeling of being Serbs, being nationalist or whatever. So we see in theater world, a lot of uh, projects that are questioning uh, populism, nationalism, chauvinism. And I would also like to underline this uh, book, this dialogue book of hospitality of Derrida and uh, to, to see what are the troops today that question uh, mig migration, that question newcomers, that question cultural diversity. There are in fact, quite a lot of them, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, how it's, I would like to try to, there are those who try to see why, what happened uh, to the societies throughout the world that we are fearing uh, the other. In Serbia, for example, the videos that went viral from India during pandemics has been from villages that were uh, putting their guards to beat eventual stranger that would come and bring the disease there. And that was the most popular police beating those that not uh, wearing mask, endangering community and so on. So, how we can deal with this uh, hostipality as create uh, with using these two words, hostility and hospitality, the Rida created this new, um, how would say, neological, neologism. Uh, and how we can compare that with necessity to develop culture and aesthetics of care especially during this COVID-19 crisis, it was present. But in many respects, we could see that solidarity and care in, in the culture of fear, which this COVID-19 crisis definitely was, culture of fear, was mostly related to so-called ours our profession. So actors were standing up for other actors. But in fact, all projects, that's what I was investigating, uh, all projects that different collectives, artists dealt with migrant uh, population, asylum seekers and so on, that they dealt in hospitals, in hospices, have been stopped. There was, of course, a very good excuse for that. The excuse was that all visits to such kind of centers have been prohibited. And that's true. They've been for the disease not to spread. But at the same time, there was no uh, reflection, debate, asking. So it was, and then the question that was put was, is it only that when we can work with suffering, trauma, loss, crisis, when we can uh, make theater projects of, uh, uh, how you say, showing our solidarity with subaltern, with vulnerable groups and so on, that then we do. What should be really, or are artists preferring so-called drama, psychosocial work in war areas? Because in Lebanon, for example, today, it's predominating. But when it's money for this kind of work expires, where the donors left, and now during COVID time, they left, artists could be leaving also. So yes, 
That's the reason why I wanted that we discuss also this culture of solidarity, of affective solidarity, how Thompson's work started in the situation of deep crisis in Africa and so on. But is it only where thousands are dead, when they are genocide, that we can develop our feeling of responsibility, solidarity, and so on? How we can develop a culture of care during our everyday life? during a normal uh, functioning of our uh, theater collective, during, uh, in the situations when there is no lockdowns or lockouts and so on, uh, but there are still a lot of homeless. There are still a lot of people in prisons and so on. But how to make artistic inclusive work uh, impactful, effective, and not uh, uh, gaining opposite values because as I saw in Lebanon, when the theater director that worked in one of the prison, I deliberately wouldn't say her name, uh, she worked on a Shakespeare performance and that meant a life to prisoners. And they really expected after that Shakespeare that something else is going to come up. But she said, goodbye, I'm now going to my artistic projects. And then they looked and they asked her and us with whom we are going to work. Because artistic collectives and artist group and theaters very often do not empower those with whom they are working so that they can continue on their own. And when they left the refugee center, the people in prison, the people in hospice feel even worse than before because they experienced something that made them feel that they are human beings. And now they know they're returning back to the situation where no one is looking at them as a human being. I think we can, I can stop sharing now in this moment the screen and maybe we can start a debate. Thank you very much, Milena. Uh, for a very, very wonderful um, lecture, which uh, in, in fact covers several different aspects um, of cultural policy, but also about um, artistic work. And um, what has struck me uh, was that, um, you know, you were talking about various dimensions of cultural policy in an era that was marked uh, by the dominance of the market, um, also exacerbation of processes of othering um, and conflict, uh, hypernationalism, um, you know, in, in different parts, I mean, bordering on fascism uh, in different parts of the world. Of course, we are seeing it um, in a very, very stark form in this country. Uh, but what is interesting is that um, how you were able to uh, actually connect all of this with um, what is happening today in COVID times. And I think that's uh, really, really special. And um, rather than look at what has happened uh, in different parts of the world in the COVID era as an exception, um, you know, what has unfolded in the realm of cultural policy in different parts of the world, and you've given, you know, very eloquently you've given several examples um, from different parts of the world, I mean, particularly from Europe, and you have spoken a lot about uh, um, Serbia and what is happening over there. Um, it it uh, really uh, brings all of this into sharp focus. The fact that these processes that have been underway in the era that we refer to as neoliberalism since the late 80s at least, 
and have actually become more and more sharpened in terms of um, you know what we um, call commercialization or the reliance on the market di dictating what artistic practice uh, is going to be promoted uh, in uh, by the state or by corporates in different countries you've actually brought that into focus by um, showing how um, you know all of this has actually become very very prominent in the in the covid uh, era so uh, from your ideas about the recognition of civic imagination where you are arguing that it should be declared a public good i think that's a very very interesting idea and is something that you know could be taken up for further discussion um, you know by various people who are interested in this whole idea of civic engagement uh, with the arts and uh, very significantly this whole idea of the aesthetics of care and drawing from um, you know feminist theory uh, the whole idea of affective solidarity where you're you're making it very clear that affective solidarity is about um, interdependencies uh, and also about um, communities uh, rather than actually talking only about care which is focused on the individual and i think these are very significant aspects which you know i'm not very uh, sure we have these kinds of discussions around cultural policy in india so i think these are these are important points that you raised and there's a lot of scope for thinking about it and uh, you know for me this has been uh, very very useful uh, thank you very much so i think we'll uh, open up for uh, for questions now um, i can see in the chat box that there are about uh, seven or eight people who have asked questions uh, so i think we'll take these questions uh, ab about 15 minutes or so perhaps uh, for the question answer session so um, let's start with Oh, there are many very difficult questions uh, that demands a lot of, uh, I see if I might start reading some of this Rakesh Sharma yeah. that uh, can we do, for example, to use art to speak about the problems in other countries. Of course, that, that can be the solution and it's done very often. And uh, for example, uh, we do throughout the world sometimes performances about Palestinian issues, to, in fact, to Israeli repression in Palestine, because in Israel itself, it's nearly impossible to do it. Or some of Israeli artists are now living exactly in Berlin, where they feel much more free. Those Israeli artists that do not uh, want to obey the rules of their uh, government and politics. Same with the Turkish people. But that's also unfortunate. Or the people have to emigrate or Kurdish issue or themes about Kurd situation of Kurds, uh, Kurdistan in Turkey, uh, it's better known in uh, outside than in Turkey itself, where the government do censorship and repression. Or Shruti Bala ask very interesting question. Uh, sorry, can I interrupt? Uh, actually, yes. if you could go to the next question, which is also related to you know international solidarity, that might actually tie up with the first question from Atin Das. How do we practice these theaters of solidarity and empathy? without appropriating struggles or taking up spaces that aren't ours? Is there more to it than research? I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm not that much uh, afraid if we have a genuine interest and empathy that we are going to appropriate. I'm really afraid that we are going to appropriate sometimes something, uh, because there are such things, people would come. I, I will take uh, examples that are very famous and known. You come, Sarajevo as a city of Bosnia was under siege for three years. 
many artists would come and make performance and become celebrity and go back home. And the people of Sarajevo stayed under the siege. And that's for me appropriation. You, you become even, and everybody is praising you as a celebrity while uh, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, you are taking uh, uh, attention from the real people that, that, are, that are there. So that is something that I'm afraid of. What happened to the picture? What's that sound? I don't know. Okay. I hear from my language, so someone who is uh, has open uh, or. Yeah, the next question from Shruti Bala. Do you think it is important or useful for artists to try to communicate with audiences who are inclined towards authoritarian or populist ideas? If yes, how do you do it when rational, reasonable arguments seem to be of no use anymore? <laughs> I haven't seen uh, successful examples of this. Uh, uh, I saw many disastrous examples of this. Uh, that it was not even possible, uh, how can I say, because in those situations, it's not about arguments, it's about emotions. And if someone is standing in front of you and saying, you are auto-chauvinist, anti-patriot, and you are attacking my national feelings, whatever you are saying, whatever you, you may take on the repertory, like Center for Cultural Decontamination, they put on the repertory whole 19th century Serbian Moderna. Still, they are anti-Serbian, anti-patriots for the right-wing movements. I haven't seen, I don't know uh, really how to uh, direct communication through theatrical work with groups, with individuals. It might be if someone would be bringing and so on. But uh, I think that that uh, the, the meeting discussion might be useful for artists in a sense that they, uh, so that they can see the logic and the way of thinking of the other. Because we have also to, to try to understand that. Why a certain group is feeling threatened? What, minority or majority, doesn't matter. We, very often, we just use like uh, scientific arguments and we say like, that was 50 years ago. Why you feel threatened? For example, for Serbian population in Croatia, we from Belgrade, when they started to say there is a race of nationalism, we feel insecure. We like, oh God, that was 50 years ago, you can't, but we still have this fear of 50 years ago. Finally, little by little, it was repeated and they, they uh, were expelled. So uh, we can say that their fears were probably not that wrong, which we scientifically research based, we thought they are totally, totally wrong. Um, next, I, I don't think we'll be able to take all the questions. It'll go uh, too long, but maybe we can start, uh, go to uh, Surendra Rao's question. Uh, I, I read it. Yeah, what's uh, going to happen to theater? In my country, uh, it's just reopened, both theater and uh, cinemas, with uh, masks, with uh, social distance, so 50% of seats. But however, big events like festivals are canceled. 
So Bitev Festival, which is our major theater festival, international one, where, for example, Naya Theater participated, Academy Theater from Pune, uh, many from India also, uh, it's postponed, but it's going to have three days of a specific kind of small gatherings, which is going to be called prologue for the next year, which is going to have double, double edition. Uh, I have to say that the, uh, the opening of the theater and cinema was also part of the lobbying and advocacy, bottom up lobbying and advocacy of cultural association because they opened up uh, gyms, how you call it, I don't know those when people practice and uh, bars and clubs. And then theater people were really mad. If cafe, restaurants and gyms are working, why then theaters where you can much better control the situation and, uh, and you, you are much more sure because it's not drank audience like in bar where you cannot prevent them hugging and so on. In theater people, will we know they're going to respect uh, uh, physical distance and so on so it's opened but theaters are allowed to choose their rhythm and to choose with which performances they are going to start because uh, suggestion mutually peer suggestion would be to go with uh, uh, chamber performances, you know, like small, not ensemble performances when there are 30 actors on the stage and so on. So we are going to see how it's going to work. Uh, I think we can take uh, only one more question. Uh, so maybe uh, I'm, you know, uh, misusing the prerogative of the chair to choose the question, uh, you know, on the basis of what, uh, on the basis of your lecture. So Samira Ayengar asks, can you talk a little more about how you imagine the aesthetics of care and how that might play out in the practice of theater? Um, I taught it on several layers, really. Uh, one layer is that within theater, we have to develop solidarity and uh, ethics and aesthetics of care regard as a part of the culture of our organization. Now, when I say within theater, I think not about auditorium, but about uh, uh, theater with the ensemble, with a group of people, which in Serbia, for example, smallest one has 50 employees, let's say 25 actors and technical staff and so on. So it's 50 people for smallest theater, up to 800 people to the national theater. So it's a, it's, Company, it's big companies. So the first of all is really, if you have within both ethics and aesthetics of care, solidarity and so on, that is something that was pretty well shown during this uh, pandemics, that uh, director and the collective had shown understanding for those who due to the children reason or they couldn't go at all to the work. And even when they uh, restarted 23rd of April, it was like reopening. And then we closed again because of reappearance. But in the first moment, uh, the schools were not working. So uh, the care about those who are parents were or those who have old parents so that they cannot uh, risk to be in touch and so on was shown. But I think also a very important part is missing in uh, Western theater, and that is really the care for the other, especially the other, which is not normal bourgeois citizen theater audience, because they are not our customer. Let's take Paris. What of French theaters are doing performances that really care about a great number of their citizens from banlieue, for sub, from suburbs, from Arab origin, for example. None. 
but you made one text, the drama text, uh, and it was on the stage in one peripheral theater, not important theater and so on, but the theater itself, they taught, and that I don't think it's aesthetics of care. They just thought we did it, we put it on the stage and that's done. And within audience, there were only, I think uh, I was with my daughter and there were probably around 50 people, all white people. No one belonging really to this Arab origin or mixed origin and so on. So for me, it meant they did it for the prestige to show off in front of peers. You see how responsible we are, how we are caring for Arabs. In fact, they don't. You don't do such performance in a bourgeois auditorium. You go to the street of the suburbs in the space where you can find those people for whom this performance is meant. And they are going to join. They are going to come to see what's happening on the street and so on. But our theaters, now we are speaking about theater theaters, like uh, with the city budget and so on, they even, I was in the board of Yugoslav Drama Theater, it's a city theater in Belgrade. A uh, year after it was burned and, uh, and they were not still working because you know, when the theater is burned, you need at least three, four years to restructure. So coming to the board, I came immediately with the fantastic ideas. Let's do site specific performances and let's, or at least let's do in the park, public park of Kalemegdan with the fortress, let's do one Shakespeare, everybody likes it. And you are going to have as many audiences as you never had in your theater with 700 seats. They looked at me like I said something very, very bad saying, first of all, if you start doing performances of the open, the city will never give up, uh, uh, give us enough theater to finish the works and to finish the building. They would say, oh, they can give performances on the open, let them do it on the open. Secondly, we are not the, the, the and thirdly and so on. And many arguments and final argument was the summertime when you propose us to make theater in the open is a, our usual term for shooting movies, making TV serials, or participating in summer festivals and earning money. And in spite of the fact that they are on payroll, they are receiving every month regular salary, they just think that they have a right to their whole summer of non-playing in their theater, but to earn money outside. So I think that in our public theaters, we are far away of any elements of the care. But in uh, uh, artistic collectives, uh, very often those that are linked uh, to different civil society movements, we have developed different forms. It's not one form of what I call the aesthetics of care. So it's not one form, it's very different. It can be participative, like in France, it used to be called uh, Théâtre de l'Animation Socioculturelle. So where the, the people uh, from community can also participate. And that's their storytelling, which is on the stage. And that's uh, one possibility. The other is that our Dark Theater is doing, for example, they're collecting stories, but they are using professional actors to tell stories from the community. But then they're firstly performing those stories in that community. So they're not going somewhere collecting stories and then they're choosing main stage in capital city to make premiere and so on, etc. And there are many other, other forms, of course. Oh, I see many questions from friends uh, also. Yes, <laughs> would you like to uh, take one last question perhaps? Uh, oh, I think we are already 
a sad story to su, do to respond. Street of amateur theater is not as relevant. Uh, I think generally that theater is not that important. Uh, I will also tell in anecdotal form. Year ago, French President Macron was visiting Belgrade. And uh, he, his uh, advisors told him that he shouldn't count only on official visit, but also unofficial ones. So he said for French Institute to organize, uh, um, uh, how we say, meeting with uh, Serbian cultural operators, artists, and so on. And now when you ask, I in fact haven't thought about it. There was no theater artist among this uh, 15 selected artists, cultural operators and so on. There were film artists, cartoonists, strip artists. There were uh, music industry, uh, yeah, film industry as a publishing, uh, more biz creative industry, business and theater definitely is not. So yes, there were one, my colleague Ivan Medenica from Bite Festival, but that's again, biggest manifestation. It's not, uh, it's not theater troupe, it's not theater as art. It's again, theater not as business, absolutely not. It's a very pro theater with concept, Theater, uh, festival with concept and so on, but still it's a theater that was in long partnership with a festival with long partnership with Nancy festival for years and so on. So it has its French relations, but obviously theater is not today important. Amateur theater is in my country in deep, deep crisis because we used to have it every high school, every city has its amateur theater as institution supported by city and so on. Nowadays, it's, uh, it's gone. Thank you. Uh, our apologies to all those whose questions we were not able to uh, take up, but I'm sure uh, Jannatya Manch will provide an opportunity for uh, for people to correspond with Milena, perhaps, and to have more detailed discussions. And uh, so uh, I think uh, now we'll hand over back to the organizers. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a lovely session. Uh, and I mean, Milena, it's always a pleasure to hear you, all the stories that you bring in. And thank you very much for uh, delivering this year's Sabdar Hashmi lecture. Uh, I think it was uh, doing it online is also, uh, you know, in a way, a uh, good thing in, a, in disguise because there were a lot of uh, our friends who were able to join us from all over the world uh, for this lecture. So thank you very much, Milena, for doing this. Uh, thank you very much, Sumangala. Uh, I, also don't know how to keep thanking I have also to as... thank Sumangala, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for chairing the session this year. Uh, I also don't know how to keep thanking uh, friends over and over again. So thank you once again to the two of you. Uh, thank you very much for to everyone, all the audience members who joined us uh, from India, from all over the world. Uh, many people from outside India. Thanks for these questions. Uh, we didn't have that much time, so we couldn't take the questions, but uh, Milena is there. She's also available on Facebook. This lecture- I, will... ho I hope you are going to copy these uh, questions and to send it to us. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, also, uh, the lecture is available on YouTube. Some of us, uh, some of your friends might not have been able to join today. Uh, so they can, and it will remain on YouTube, on Janna Temanch uh, YouTube channel. So you can catch it. Uh, the entire lecture, uh, it's also been recorded, uh, but it will be there on, uh, on social media. So thank you very much uh, once again. Can I ask every, all the audience members uh, to switch on their uh, videos? Uh, keep your microphones on mute, but switch on your videos. Probably Milena would also like to see, uh, and Sumangala will also like to see. Faces and, and to uh, make a photo. To make a photo the zoom ritual that we all are following these days 